Welcome to the Henry AI Labs walkthrough of Keras code examples. Keras has provided 56 code examples implementing popular ideas in deep learning. This ranges from the basics such as simple MNIST and IMDB text classification, all the way to cutting edge research ideas such as knowledge distillation, supervised contrastive learning, and transformers. We'll also explore fun generative examples like variational autoencoders and cyclegan. My contribution to these code examples is to explain every single line of code in each of them, walking through each of the individual Keras examples. I'm not the author of these code examples. Please consider starting the GitHub repositories to show support to the original authors. This next Keras code example will show you how to use the efficient net for transfer learning. Efficient net was the product of large scale neural architecture search to find the most efficient way to scale up the size of deep convolutional neural networks. It's a conventional wisdom in deep learning that generally deeper neural networks, bigger neural networks with respect to a combination of depth and then as well as hidden dimension width or input image resolution size is one of the key themes of the efficient net paper is looking at these three different dimensions of scaling up convolutional neural networks, scaling up the width of intermediate features, the depth, the number of layers, and then the input resolution of the image. So efficient net was the product of searching for the best way to scale this up, and it's resulted in this uh, really interesting performance in ImageNet and all sorts of computer vision benchmarks. And also what's really interesting about this and really useful for our Keras code examples is that, so the product of the search is first they find this one block to repeat over and over again, but they also search for the hyperparameters of how to scale this up. So they have different uh, variants going from B0, B1, B2, B3, up to B7. And this is useful because uh, depending on what computing you have at home, you might be using the Google Collab uh, 16 gigabyte GPU where you can only really use like a B3 efficient net, or maybe you're running on your own computer where you want to use a B0. Maybe you're doing a mobile deployment, in which case I wouldn't even recommend this. I'd use like mobile net, but you could imagine that you can scale from B0 up to B7. So you have this uh, option that they've created by searching through optimal scaling parameters to fit what kind of computational resources you have. So it's a really interesting use. Another really interesting thing about the efficient net models is how they integrate with this uh, Keras applications ecosystem of having pre-trained models. This has been really popular as well as things like uh, Hugging Faces open source transformers, where you have these pre-trained models that you take off the shelf and then adapt to your problem in the transfer learning paradigm. Transfer learning is incredibly useful if you have a small data set. Say you only have a thousand images that you want to classify. It's extremely useful to start from one of these pre-trained models. Interestingly, these pre-trained models have been pre-trained mostly with supervised learning with ImageNet, which is kind of an interesting difference between, say, the mass language modeling self-supervised pre-training that's used in natural language processing. So maybe we'll see a wave of uh, image GPT style, uh, maybe autoregressive pixel modeling, but as of now, it's definitely the uh, supervised pre-trained models that we're using off the shelf in transfer learning. So EfficientNet is a pre-trained model with supervised learning. It's one of the most powerful models for computer vision image classification that have ever been created. And in this tutorial, we're gonna see how to fine tune it so that you can use it for your own problems. The tutorial begins by further describing and introducing the EfficientNet model. In my opinion, what's interesting to note is the B0 to B7 scaling, how this has been discovered by uh, searching through compound scaling hyperparameters, and then also uh, they note that you can see the latest in training efficient nets in uh, the Google repository from TensorFlow in this link, which will be linked in the description of this video. So it is worth noting that some of the latest state of the arts in efficient net performance come with advanced data augmentation schemes and extremely advanced semi-supervised learning settings. These include things like uh, noisy training with, uh, with the self-training with the noisy student thing. That is about having this semi-supervised loop where you have labeled and unlabeled data, and the efficient net is just kind of a piece of that puzzle, as well as another paper titled uh, Meta Pseudo Labels. I have uh, video explanations of both of these papers on Henry AI Labs if you're interested. They're both ways of uh, improving the training and they lead to the state of the art of efficient net. It's not like you're just gonna uh, take one of these efficient net models off the shelf, train it on ImageNet, and then pass the or match the state of the art. It's done with these uh, pretty intense uh, semi-supervised training loops. So that's just a little bit of the preface on this Keras code example, and it is really great that this uh, code example has so much background and reads like a hybrid of a, of a research paper as well as providing these code examples. This next block of information should be very important to you if you're using this on your custom problem, like, uh, you know, whatever, image classification, maybe you're using this for a Kaggle competition or whatever it may be. But the efficient net models are, uh, they scale up with respect to depth, width, as well as input resolution. 
So it's important to note the input resolution to each of the different B0 up to B7s increases as you increase the size of the model. So if you were using uh, B4, you want to pass in 380 by 380 RGB images, whereas if you're using B0, that's too large of an image to pass into the efficient net model. So it's worth noting this with respect to adapting the efficient net. This tutorial is about fine tuning it for your problem. So it's worth to take a note of this input resolution with respect to, uh, you know, whatever your problem is. The next block of code denotes uh, this right here, next block of description denotes another essential thing for understanding uh, transfer learning with the Keras applications. If you do include top equals false, you're uh, taking off the final dense layer of 1000 ImageNet class logits and attaching your own classification layer onto the end of the feature extractor efficient net B0 neural network. This next block of information is describing the stochastic depth regularization in the efficient net models. So this is a really interesting technique for uh, regularizing, preventing overfitting. We see things like data augmentation, which is one strategy to prevent overfitting. Uh, dropout works with individual neurons, whereas stochastic depth, as mentioned uh, in this uh, tutorial and block of code used in the efficient net model, stochastic depth is going to do dropout, but instead of an individual neuron, it's an entire path of a deep neural network. So you would isolate a given uh, propagation of features and just completely ice it to zero to strengthen the model and make it use the entire uh, connection. So it's kind of like anti-sparsity to be trying to mask out these individual nets. It could be interesting to see, it could be an interesting research direction to see the correlation between say lottery ticket hypothesis and the stochastic depth regularization. But just so you know what it is, it's a way of uh, regularizing these uh, efficient nets by dropping out paths rather than just neurons as in uh, the dropout. So with that introduction to what the efficient net model is, this Keras code example is going to be showing you how to use the efficient net B0 and the Stanford dogs data set. We're going to be classifying the fine grained classification of individual dog breeds, such as the difference between a pit bull or a golden retriever and so on. So we're going to resize these to 224 again to be compatible with the efficient net B0. This is the smallest version of the efficient net. And then we're going to uh, set up our distributed training strategy. If you're using that, if you're going to be using a uh, multiple GPUs to train this, you can use the tf.distribute uh, mirror strategy and so on. The Stanford dogs data set is provided in the TensorFlow datasets API. TFDS is how we'll uh, alias this when we're importing TensorFlow datasets. TensorFlow datasets, similar to uh, keras.datasets or uh, torch text, torch vision, the Kaggle API, the hugging face datasets library, uh, and papers with code is also just organized this way of uh, collecting all the data sets that are really easy to load into uh, machine learning workflows. So this is an example of an academic data set that's been uh, already curated and it has this really easy API where you just call uh, tfds.load and then you just stand for dogs. So it's as easy as that to get started with the data set. And this is kind of a new trend in deep learning, in my opinion, uh, setting this for maybe about four years, seeing this recent trend and moving more and more data sets into this easy integration where it's just a function call to have an entire data set in your working directory. So if you've been following along with the Keras code examples walkthroughs on Henry AI Labs or have some familiarity with these uh, TFDS and TF.data objects like dataset from tensor slices, this is all uh, pretty standard stuff. We have the, um, this is a TF.data object that we get from TFDS.load and it's common to have the syntax of dot map. And then in this case, we don't already have a function. So we're defining a function with the Lambda we have lambda image label, and then we're just processing the passing in this um, pre-processing of resizing the images down to 224 by 224. So this is a quick lambda functions or a quick way to assign a pre-processing function with the tf.data object dot map. So we're just pre-processing the data and preparing it, and then we're going to visualize some of the examples. So these are the this is the Stanford dogs task. These are the resized images for the sake of visualization, not 224 by 224 is bigger than this. But this is some visualizations. We see these different uh, types of dogs that we're going to try to classify with transfer learning. And the transfer learning is essential for this. If you're going to try to just train this from scratch, it'd be very difficult because you have very low uh, cardinality of number of examples in each of the particular dog breeds. So it helps to have the pre-trained uh, representations to build on top of to make this fine grained classification work. The next step in our pre-processing pipeline is to add data augmentation. Data augmentation is one of the most interesting phenomena in deep learning where we apply these transformations to the data space in order to prevent overfitting, introduce semantic invariances, and overall improve the training of our model by providing it with a better data set to learn from. So in this case, we're adding random rotations, random translations, horizontal flipping, and color manipulations like random contrast. This is a visualization of some of these augmentations applied to this Yorkshire Terrier image. We see it rotated, 
uh, horizontally flipped. This is an example of horizontally flipped. This is an example of a high magnitude rotation. And I don't think any of these examples really communicate what uh, random contrast is doing. But we can also see random translation, how it shifts it up and down a little bit. This is the idea of data augmentation to uh, regularize data in the input space itself. The next thing to do is to categorically encode the class labels into one hot encoded vectors. And we just do this by calling tf.onehot, the label, and then the number of classes. So say so we have uh, 10 classes like CIFAR10 and the label is seven, it'll turn it into, or it's, the label is one, it'll turn it into zero, one, zero, 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 and so on. So we just uh, pass in the syntax when you call dot map with a tf.data object, uh, like right here, as well as, um, Right here, we pass in the image and the label for the function call when you just drop it in the dot map with a tf.data object. And then um, this is kind of what happens under the hood with respect to the pre uh, fetching and all that. So I wouldn't personally worry about this yet. And then uh, so on. So this is just all we do to uh, make these uh, tf.data objects do efficient pre processing of the data. The image augmentation itself is actually going to be integrated uh, within the model. We see how we have the input layer and then the image augmentation is going to happen on the GPU, and this is faster because uh, these data augmentations like rotations, translations, the way you actually rotate an image, if you watch like a three blue, one brown video on how this works is, it's a matrix multiplication to take a pixel grid and then multiply it by a rotation matrix, and that's how you rotate an image. So it is more efficient to do these matrix multiplications on the GPUs, especially with these uh, large batches of images. We've pre-processed the data and created a tf.data object ds underscore train. We have a validation data set ds underscore test, and we can also use it. We'll also use this at the end. We'll use we're, this is just a train test split, even though we're calling it validation data. So the interesting thing about this block of code is how easy it is to use efficientnet b0 for transfer learning. We just import efficientnet b0, and it's just this one line of code: efficientnet outputs equals efficientnet b0. We start with the inputs with our input layer, giving it our image size 224, 224. Then we pass in our augmentation layer, and then we're just right into our model, passing it in like this. And we see we use include top equals true, and we're able to set the number of classes to be the 120 output classes for Stanford dogs. Honestly, I'm not exactly sure how this works. I thought that you would have to do include top equals false, and then do uh, model dense passing in outputs with 120. But I guess this is another way you can do this. You can have include top equals true, classes equals number of classes to adapt this to the number of uh, classification classes that you have for your task that you're uh, fine tuning efficient at four. So I wasn't, I didn't know that you could do it like this. So then we see this connection model connect inputs with outputs, compile it with categorical cross entropy, the atom optimizer, 40 epochs, and then the holy grail of Keras models, just calling model.fit and doing nothing. So verbose equals two means it's not gonna be uh, progressively sliding along. It's only gonna give us an output at the end of each epoch step. So another interesting thing that the author of this notebook did is include this uh, epoch scaler. I'm not sure exactly how, <laughs> how they did that either, but this is a pretty cool thing where you can slide this for the sake of interactive Jupyter notebooks, sharing code and uh, doing coding tutorials. So from here, we get the summarization of our model. We see that we just have this one layer with the entire efficient net encapsulated in it. Model.summary doesn't take apart the entire efficient net, which you know might be a little disappointing, but it's still interesting. We see that we have 4.2 million parameters in the B0 model. And then we see our training is beginning. It's taking about 88 seconds per epoch on this uh, Google Collab GPU runtime. It might be faster or slower depending on how you're running it. And we see that the validation accuracy is continuing to improve as is the training accuracy as it's classifying these dog images into 120 different dog breeds. So we're back and our model is finished training. It took about a minute and a half for each of these epochs. In the end, after 40 epochs, we achieved 21% validation accuracy and 63% on the training set. So here's the interesting thing. In this case, we used efficient net weights equals none. Now let's see the performance improvement when we use the pre-trained image net weights compared to a randomly initialized efficient net architecture. So in this following code, we use the uh, we use the previously pre-trained image net weights by instead doing weights equals image net here. So now we're going to have a very similar uh, architecture. Instead, we're going to include top equals false and rebuild our own custom dense later, as I previously mentioned, is how I think you would do this soft max activation, dropout, and then this average pooling to uh, smoothen out the dimensionality of the last output from our efficient net with the image net weights. So with this model, we're gonna get a much better accuracy. We see right off of the first epoch, we're already at 69% validation accuracy compared to our previously reached 21%. Comparing these two curves, when we start off with the image net pre-trained weights, we end up achieving 76% validation accuracy, and our training set is still only at 66% because we've only done 25 epochs of training. We see our training curve and our validation curve. 
Compared to when we had a randomly initialized efficient net, our training is starting to overfit the data and our validation isn't increasing at the same pace as our training set. So the next step to do is to test out freezing the weights. There are many ways to do this. It's often common when transfer learning to freeze all the weights of the pre-trained model and then just evaluate the linear classification ability of those pre-trained weights. In this tutorial, what we're doing is we're still gonna be fine tuning most of the efficient net B0 weights, but we're freezing the batch normalization layers. So for each of the batch normalization layers, they have learnable scale and shift parameters. There's a ton of research on the importance of batch normalization. Recently at the time of uh, publishing this video, there's a very popular paper that's going out because uh, researchers at DeepMind have figured out how to make uh, image network without normalization at all. But generally there's a famous paper called uh, training batch normalization and only batch normalization that shows how influential these parameters are. So note, and then just empirically, you can see the results right here. We start off right away with 78% uh, validation accuracy compared to the previous step of initializing at 69% with transfer learning. So the idea here is that you're keeping the scale and shift parameters that have been learned through pre-training on ImageNet compared to learning new scale and shift parameters on this Stanford DOGS dataset. Finally, the tutorial concludes with some tips for fine-tuning efficient net. Quickly, there's some advice on unfreezing the layers, the idea of keeping the batch normalization frozen, and so on, and then some other tips like simply scaling up from B1, B2, B3 isn't guaranteed to improve, exponential moving average is another technique to uh, help with uh, not changing the weights too quickly. There's a lot of research on this. There's another famous paper from uh, researchers at Hugging Face, where they look at transfer learning and they look at the direction of the magnitude of the gradients. There's a lot of there's a lot of research, active research in transfer learning and exactly at what pace the model should adapt to the new task. Then uh, another note on the optimizer, and then uh, the idea of batch sizes and probably an empirical result result that was found with validation accuracy. So then finally, the tutorial concludes. This is what you would do in order to get the latest uh, efficient net weights as the TensorFlow team continues to build this model. They, as mentioned earlier in the tutorial, uh, this Google research team is heavy on these uh, semi-supervised learning algorithms like Noisy Student. Uh, they have this JFT 300 million data set and they're always improving this efficient net model with these new algorithms. So it may be useful for whatever problem, if you're using this in production or for some product or something, it may be useful to be grabbing the new weights by using this shell command to get the latest weights and then you would load them in by when you call the, when you initialize the efficient net model, you would do weights equals and then this file path that you have in your local directory. To summarize, in my opinion, this was the best Keras code example that I've seen so far. I think I'm into about uh, seven or eight of these and I really liked how this one ties together background on the research, different considerations with transfer learning and the efficient net model, explaining all the ins and outs of the efficient net model, a really nicely organized tutorial showing you how to use the Stanford Dogs TensorFlow datasets API and then uh, three different settings of showing first the performance when you just train from scratch then showing uh, training from the image net weights, and then showing when you're not only fine tuning the image weights, but particularly you're freezing the batch normalization layer. So you're not updating the scale and shift parameters that were learned while pre-training on image net. So really interesting results. I learned a lot from uh, going through this code example and I hope you did as well. So thanks for watching and please check out the rest of the Keras code example series on Henry AI Labs. Mm -hmm.